Okay, Jason, I'm going to go over these problems a little bit more in depth than, than the Zoom meeting. Uh, I, just, I just think they need more um, clarification just, instead of just giving an answer. Okay, so we have this reaction, and uh, and we have delta H. This is this is a plus. That means uh, you have to add heat for the reaction to take place. Okay. All right. Um, so think. So here's our equation. So think as heat is actually part of the equation. So the key thing here is we're at equilibrium, and therefore we're going to be thinking about Le Chatelier's principle. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to increase the amount of our our reactant. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, there's different ways you can do it. One is, uh, well, if you can force the reaction to the left, that means if you add more O2 or more BAC, you will make more of the reactant. Another way is, is that if you took away, um, if you took some of the BaO2, the reaction would make more of this. But the other thing is, is that if you remove heat, it's also going to move, remove the re, move the reaction to the left. So uh, let's look at our four possibilities. It says remove some O2. If you remove O2, the reaction is going to be forced to the right because you're not going to have enough O2 at equilibrium, and it's going to try to get add more O2. Same thing with the BA. It's number two. If you move BA, okay, uh, that's going to force your reaction to the right. Uh, helium, what it, that's going to do is it's going to increase the uh, uh, the pressure inside, but it increases the pressure by the same. Um, it's so that it doesn't have any effect on it, okay, because you don't, you only have a gas over here, so uh, it actually, um, and that would cause, you know, that's not the issue here. So how about D, lowering the temperature? If you lower the temperature, you have to remove heat. So if we remove heat, we will pull, that will pull the reaction to the left, and you form more of your reactant. So D. Okay, uh, problem number 11. So once to know is if you have 200 mils of 2 molar NaOH and you had 5 mil, 500 mils of 1 molar HCl, what would the pH be? Okay, so um, so find out how many moles of NaOH you have. So that's going to be 200 mils, the same thing as 2 liters. All right. And 2 molar is 2 moles per liter. So the amount of NaOH is 0.4 moles of NaOH. Okay, how many moles of HCl do you have? Well, 500 mils is half a liter. Okay, it's one mole per liter. Okay, so that means you have 0.5 moles of HCl. Okay, so one for every one mole of NaOH, it'll titrate one mole of HCl. So what you're going to end up with is 0.1 moles of HCl. Okay, and that's going to be in a concentration of 0.7 liters. Okay, so so the concentration of our and so really means is that we have it's because the HCl completely dissociates. If you have 0.1 mole of HCl, you have 0.1 moles of H H plus. So the concentration here is um so the concentration of the H plus is going to equal to 0.1 divided by 0.7, okay, or 0.143 molar H plus. Okay, so uh, pH is equal to the minus log 
of H plus. So what we would have here is the pH is going to be the minus log of 0.143. Okay, and when you do that, the answer ends up being 0.845. Okay, which is close to 1. All right, so it's A. Okay, number 19. Uh, here we have is we have HClO2 is a weak acid and it's going to dissociate into H plus and ClO minus. All right. Uh, okay, so what we do is we add HCl and change the pH 2.4. <clears throat> okay, so what we do now is what we're going to take uh, potassium hydroxide, which is a strong base, and what it's going to do is increase it's going to um, increase the pH to 10.5. Uh, the amount of the amount of which of the following species increases with as you increase increase the KOH. So as you add the KOH, okay, what happens? Just focus on the OH part. The OH part is going to grab a hold of the H plus, okay? And what's going to be left is more of the, especially when you get high acidic, um, and it's just, be, you're going to, this is going to get be all eaten up in a sense, and then you're going to end up uh, having an increase of uh, the, this this chlorate ion all right now um so there you, i don't know if you would think this or not but if this was, was near a buffer solution if you added this koh and it was a lower ph like five or six what would happen is you would produce more of the acid all right but because we have so much base it's gonna the oh is gonna Gobble up all the H plus, okay? So none of the so none of the uh, weak acid could be formed, and so you get more of your chloride ion. Okay. So and the key thing here is is that you're at a high pH, all right? So if it would have been a lower pH, you may have made more of the the acid, all right? But um, because you're at a high, really high pH. All this gets all this gets changed over to uh, to these to these two guys, and uh, the OH will combine with H plus of four chlorate. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. This you have to really think about this one. So this is dissociation of of, of water into uh, acid and base, um, and it, it goes back and forth. And has a pKa at certain temperatures. So, right, the way I think of here is Kw, and this is going to be slightly different than its real uh, definition. It can be is going to be product product, which is the H3O plus. All right, times the OH minus, and we don't usually put this in an equation. But you can put it H2O, all right? Okay, it's usually not there, but we're going to do it for our purposes here. Okay, um, okay, so we have this equation here, and if you notice, is is that the pK goes goes down as you increase the temperature. Okay. So remember what I told you is if pK goes down, that means K is actually going up. All right. So if you increase the temperature, the K goes up. Okay. So what is K? K is the amount of uh, product to reactant. 
So that means is, is that as you increase the temperature, you get more product, okay? Because K, okay, K, all right, is product over reactant. So to get a bigger K, you get more product. So how do you get more product? You add heat. Okay, so what has to happen is by adding heat or increasing the temperature, you're going to push the reaction to the right, causing more product to be formed and getting a larger K. All right, so let's see what our answers have here. All right, um, the dissociated water is an exothermic reaction. No, it's it's endothermic reaction. The pH of water is seven. No, uh, it's each one of these pKs dub is the the pH the pH of pure water um, is going to be half of whatever these guys are here. As the temperature increases, the pH of the pure water uh, increases. All right, no, okay you're getting more, you're making more of your acid, all right? Okay, so no, actually the pH would go down. Okay, remember pH, like, so if pH goes up, that means it goes down, you got more acid. If it goes up, you have less acid, all right? And then the final one says you have, uh, that as the temperature increases, the pH goes down. Okay, and that's what happens here. As you add heat, you get more product, that means you get more OH, I mean, acid, and that means you get more, um, the pH will be increased, I mean, decreases, okay. Okay, so, key thing here is you notice the temperature goes up, pK goes down. What that means, the temperature goes up, K goes up. If K goes up, means you got more product. Okay, so, the reaction is, so if you add heat, you get more product, you get more acid, okay? All right, uh, so we have this, this equation here, um, delta H is less than zero. That means this is an exothermic reaction, so we could be heat over here. And what we're gonna do is, uh, we're going to increase the temperature to 650 degrees Kelvin and and look at these possible what happens to KC. Uh, all right, A says KC will increase because of the activation energy. We don't know anything about the activation energy. Uh, they need to tell us. There's nothing in all in it that has any idea about activation energy. B, same thing. We don't know if there's more reactant or products by changing KC. All right. Um, right, C, KC will decrease because the reaction is exothermic. So I think this is correct, this, this one's here, because if you add heat, which is uh, what we're doing here, we increase temperature, what's that going to do is going to force the reaction back to the reactant. That means the, you're going to have more reactant in the product, and therefore K is going to go down. Okay, because re K is product over reactant. Okay, so now we have, I mean, yeah, we have more reactant. So that means K would be a smaller number. So I believe it's C. A D, a K isn't constant, a changes with temperature. Okay, so uh, you may want to make sure you ask, ask your professors about this or your teacher, but I'm pretty sure it's C. All right. Okay, Jason, um, I had to think about this one a little bit longer. Uh, it's it's an easy one once you figure it out, but uh, it's, it's not straightforward. I mean, well, it is straightforward. You just have to think about it. Okay, so the question says this. is if you have carbon monoxide plus hydrogen and forms ethanol and it's an endothermic reaction, I mean, exothermic reaction, um, and... Uh, it says, here's here's the information it tells us, this is problem number 22, a one molar sample of CO and a one molar sample of H2 are pumped into a rigid, rigid previously evacuated 
two liter reaction at 483. So the key thing here is that <clears throat> we know that there's one mole per two liters of both both substances. Okay, so we can figure out their initial concentrations. Uh, so the initial concentration for each one of these is one mole in two liters. And so the initial concentration for both of these is 0.5 and 0.5. Okay, we're going to set up a nice table and hopefully you'll see why I do this um, as I go, go forward, forward into it. Okay, so initial concentration 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0. Okay, so what, what we need to do to have it go to equilibrium is, is that the reaction is so you have nothing but reactants, so the reaction is going to move to the right, okay, and form some product. <clears throat> okay, so that means you're going to lose some x. Uh, you're going to lose some 2x here because of this coefficient, and you're going to gain 1x, okay. And the, the number that you put in front of the, this x is the coefficient, okay. So 1, so 1 here, 2 here, and 1 here. And then at, at equilibrium, you have 0.5 minus x, 0.5 minus 2x, and x. So this problem over here tell, ask us, what is the relationship between the final concentrations at equilibrium? Well, we have that information right here, OK? And um, so we're going to figure that out using this, this row right here. <clears throat> so. Let's let's put in some arbitrary x value. I mean, we don't have to figure it out because it'll, it doesn't say to find x. It just it just tells us we need to find a relation between ship between each one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick 0.1. All right. Now I could pick any other number, but uh, it, we've got to be careful that you don't pick some x that makes makes these values uh, uh, negative. Okay. So 0.1 will work. So we'll, let's see what we get when you get 0.1, all right? So the CEO, if it was 0.1, it would be 0.5 minus 0.1 equals 0.4, okay? All right, the hydrogen is going to be 0.5 minus 0.2, because you have to multiply the 0.1 by 2, and then the final concentration would be 0.3. Okay, and then this uh, final product is going to just be 0.1. And so, it doesn't matter what value you put in here, what you're always going to get is you're always going to get the CO is greater than the H2 is greater than the methanol. Okay, so let's go over our answers and see which ones work for that one. All right, so A doesn't work, okay. Uh, <clears throat> you can see that H2 is not greater than 2 times CO, all right? It might be sometimes, but in this case it doesn't, and that if it's not in this case, it's not going to be at all. So that's not true. All right, how about B? So this says H2 is less than CO, okay? Well, yes, okay? H2 is less than CO. So this looks like it's probably a good answer, all right? All right, so let's look at the other ones that says CO is equal to CH3. Nope. You can see that these two aren't equal. And then finally, CO is equal to the product. And so that this one is wrong. So your answer is B, okay? All right, hope, hope, that, hope that, that, uh, that helps you out, okay? Okay, this is problem number 23. And, and I... I couldn't quite, I, I had a good idea what the answer was, um, and, but I wasn't quite sure why, <laughs> right? I just needed some time to think about it. Um, you know, your, your teacher probably knows the right off his head, that's because her head or whatever, because she's done this so many times. Um, you know, one of the things about this is, is you got to be able to think, 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 and, uh, and that's what I try to do with this one. Also, when you do these problems, these they really try to stay away, have you stay away from doing a lot of calculations. They just try, try to have you find relationships between things and sort of intuitively connect dots between things. So really try to pay attention to why certain things have certain answers, okay? Uh, sometimes you do the calculations, but don't rely on calculations. The, the AP test 
is not really based on calculation. It's about understanding. Okay, so um, so let's go over this. this same, here's our same problem. Okay, now, okay, so this is a problem. It says a mixture of CO, H2 is pumped into a two liter reaction vessel and has a pressure of 1.2 atmospheres. Okay, so we want, we want to know, it says what will be the total pressure of the system if the volume of the reaction vessel is reduced to one liter at constant constant temperature when it reaches equilibrium okay all right okay so you got to think about this all right so we have our equation here so we're told that the initial pressure of the reactants together is 1.2 atmospheres okay therefore what this means is, is that if the reaction doesn't take place at all okay you're going to have 1.2 atmospheres so that should just that's just obvious okay all right now if you half the volume from one from two liters to one liter that's going to double the pressure according to Boyle's law okay so that's that's one example so the, we're going to look at two examples one example is the reaction going not going at all now the other extreme is it going all to product okay and equilibrium falls in between the two so let's look at the other extreme where the reaction goes to completion. I'm going to do a little bit of arbitrary numbers here, but it's, it'll, what the idea is to get the idea, all right? Suppose there are 600 particles of, a re, of each reactant. I know it doesn't say that here, but we're going to assume that. And each particle applies 0.1 atmospheres. Okay, so if you just do the math, 600 particles times 0.1 uh, so each 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 one of these guys is going to apply 600. Uh, I mean six atmospheres. So six atmospheres plus six atmospheres would be 1.2 atmospheres. Okay. All right. So let's just let's just start out with that. Okay. Suppose what we we're going to look at the 600. Uh, we want to use up. We're going to look at this is like a limiting um, reactant problem. So what we want to do is uh, try to use up all the CO and and try to use up all the H2. So there's going to be two different scenarios here. Suppose we want to use up all the 600 CO particles. Okay, because the chemical reaction says for every one CO you need two H2s, that means if you start out with 600 COs, you would need 1,200, okay? And we can see we don't have that. We only have 600 of each. Okay, so let's let's not let's not use this one, all right? Okay. So now let's let's do it the other way. Say let's uh, we want to use up all 600 of the H2. All right. To do that, we only need to use up you only need to use 300 to CO, which we have. So we had 600 of each. Okay. So when we get done, we will have how much? Uh, we will have 300 of the CO left over that didn't react. We'll have none of the H2, and we would have made 300 particles of the methanol. So we have a total of 600 particles here. Each particle has uh, a pressure of 0.01. So 600 times 0.01, the final pressure in this scenario is uh, 0.6 atmospheres. Okay, not, not six. All right, um, and then, uh, so, uh, so this is the other extreme. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna half the volume all right. You're going to half the volume, so this pressure is going to double. Okay, so it's going to turn into 1.2 atmospheres. Okay, so what we have here is two extremes. So one extreme is no reaction at all. In that case, you would have after you've decreased the um, 
volume, you'd have 2.4. Okay, on the other side, if the reaction goes to full completion, it'd be 1.2 atmosphere. Well, equilibrium falls somewhere in between the two, okay? All right, it's neither gone completion or, and it has started, okay? All right, so let's look at our possible answers. It says A, less than 1.2, no. It's greater than 1.2, but less than 2.4. That's what we said right here, okay? So it looks like it could be B. 2.4, it'd be 2.4 if we only had one, if we had it going, if it didn't, um, if the reaction didn't take place at all. And it's definitely not greater than 2.4 because we're stuck between the two either um, not being used up, not used at all, to being completely used up. Okay, so uh, so hopefully that you can see how that works. Um, and again, I just came up with some arbitrary numbers here for, for these 600. Just, I mean, we could have messed around with different combinations, but I thought this one would be the best one to use. Okay, so this this is a buffer uh, situation here. So you have so you have uh, this is acetic acid, HCC2H3O2. Okay, is is weak acid, and um, it forms. This, okay, naturally, that's what it does. And so when you add the salt of of the acid, what you're doing is you're increasing the amount of the conjugate base. And what that'll do is it basically creates a store of this guy here, which can absorb any acid you add to the equation add any acid to it and what it'll do is if you added acid from somewhere else that acid is going to combine with the conjugate base and it's going to form uh, the acetic acid and it's not going to change the amount of H plus okay so this guy here is a buffer we call so by adding more of the the salt okay what it does is if you add H plus, that H plus is, so if you add an acid, which relates to H plus, the H plus is not going to increase this guy here. It's going to actually be absorbed by the conjugate base and form this, the acid, okay? So there will be no change in H plus. So let's let's look at our possible answers. Uh, this ain't it, okay? It has to do with the conjugate base, all right? So this doesn't have it is either. That's not it. Uh, does this look like this is a good one? Okay, so we have acid plus conjugate base. Yeah, this one looks real good, all right? Um, this isn't it, all right? That's that's just a weird one there, an H2. So this is exactly what I just said, all right? Okay, H plus or H3O plus gets absorbed by the buffer, forms the acid, and leaves the H plus concentration the same, which is uh, what we measure in pH. Hopefully that helps. Okay, so this 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 problem here, number 29, relates to uh, uh, Hess's law. And so what we want to do is these two equations here, one and number two, uh, can manip be manipulated to form this equation here, okay? And so how do we do that? All right, so, uh, okay, so we can see that this is, we want to have Fe, F2 on the reactant side, and we see it here, so we don't have to do anything to this equation, so it's perfectly fine. Okay, here we have 2H+. plus. Uh, the equation that has the H+, plus is this one. But we need two, so it looks like we have to multiply this equation by two to get that. All right, 
Well, what does that do? All right, so if we do, now we have 2f minus. Okay, and you can see that it will cross out with that. We have 2h plus, which will give us this. And we have 2h plus, which will give us this. So that looks like exactly what we need to do. So um, if we multiply the equation by 2, what we have to do is we have to multiply this by itself. So now this becomes, or square it, okay? So this becomes 10 to the 6th. Okay, so um, so now we have these, when you add this equation with this equation, we get this equation. Now what we need to do is multiply these two equations, these two rates together. And so we end up getting uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 6 times 2 times 10 to the 6, which is simply 2. So K3 should equal 2. Okay, what does that mean? It means that, remember, K is a relationship between product to reactant. Okay, so this tells me I have, so this is like saying 2 to 1. Okay, so this means I have, the relationship is there's two products for a reactant. That means the reaction is going to move to the right. And um, naturally, and uh, so, and it's ther thermodynamically favorable. Anytime you have reaction going to the right, it's going to be uh, thermodynamically favorable. So um, let's take a look at it. All right, what do we got here? So uh, on the base of the information, the dis dissolution of FeF2 and the acetic solution. <clears throat> thermodynamically favorable because K2 is greater than 1. You know, uh, that's, no, you have to have both of these, these values. Both these values do, will determine uh, what this value is. So it's not just based on number 2. Uh, it's, is it because of K3 greater than 1? Yeah, that's that's the answer. But, uh, but let's go to C. It's not thermodynamically favorable because K1. Nope. Remember, it's that this equation is related both to 1 and 2, so this is wrong. And then th thermodynamically, because K3 is less than 1, no. K3 is greater than 1, it's 2, so therefore this is wrong either. So B is your answer. Okay, so this is a similar problem we, I, I did in a previous vid video for you. So we have, we're going to have to use the ice table, So we have, but it's a reverse action, reaction. But still, we see it before. Okay. All right, it says um, well, you have one liter, you have one, 1. 1.5 moles. One mole and 0.5. So uh, let's change them all to concentration. So the concentration of the PCL3 is is uh, 1.5. So let's set up the ice table. Well, it's not quite ice at this point. Actually, let's stop right there. Because what we're doing is we're going to figure out the reaction quotient. Okay, so we're not going to find out any change. So let's put in our, our um, values first. So our value of PCL3 is 1.5 molar. Uh, the CL is 1 molar. And the uh, PCL5 is 2.5 molar. All right. So what we have to do is find the reaction quotient. Okay. The reaction quotient is going to be similar to the equation, uh, equilibrium equation. So it's going to be PCL5. Uh, over to PCL3 times the CL2. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, so we get uh, PCL3 is 2.5, uh, 1.5 times 1. And when we do that, 
we get 5 over 3, which is 1.6. Okay, so the Q is 1.6. So uh, how does that relate to the K? K is greater than Q. Or Q is less than K. Now, I just, I my memory is, is that when K is greater than Q, the reaction is going to go to the right. Okay, so this reaction um, to to get to equilibrium will move to the right, and uh, to get to equilibrium, so you get uh, so you get um, okay. So actually, we can figure out the new pressures as well. Okay, so I know the uh, the K, K is, uh, so it's going to be either A or C. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is actually figure out the, the pressures using the ice tables. Okay, so uh, Okay, I have a three. All right, that's I know it's it's hard to draw with this thing. Okay, so I have one point five, one, and two point five. So I just said the reaction is going to be going to the right. So that means minus x, minus x, and plus x here. Okay, and then you know K is going to be equal to product, which is 2.5 plus X divided by uh, 1.5 minus X. times 1 minus x, and that all has to equal 6.5. Right, um, so you need to expand this out to get x and, and then solve for x. You, it ends up being a quadratic equation. And when you do that, you end up getting two values of x. x equals... 2.1 or 5.52. Okay, 2.1 doesn't make sense because if you take a 1.5 and track 2.1, you get a negative number. So you're going to track, you're going to use 0.52 as your x value. Um, and when you do that, your concentration of PCL3 is point, basically 1, 0.98. Your concentration, your CL2 is 0.48, we'll just say 0.5. And your PCL5 is uh, 3, basically 3. So the total pressure here is going to be 4.5. So the pressure increases because the original pressure um, was one one and a half moles plus two and a half moles uh, so was one four was five okay and now it's four and a half okay so actually the the pressure has gone down okay so the original pressure had 1.5 2.5, 5, and now our new pressure is 1 plus 1.5 or 4.5, and so the, actually the pressure decreases. So um, let's see. All right, so this is a kinetics problem. Uh, so carbon monoxide plus nitrous oxide 
NO plus carbon dioxide. So here and this is how it's made. So first step is combining two of the NO2s to form an intermediate NO3 uh, I NO. And this is the rate limit step. That means this one's gonna is the bottleneck. It's gonna air this whole this the whole the speed of reaction is gonna be dependent on this guy. All right, the second step uh, takes the intermediate and combines it with the carbon carbon oxide to form our products. Okay. All right, so what do we say here? Which of the following statements is not true? So NO3 is a catalyst for the reaction. So a catalyst is is not consumed in a chemical reaction. You can see that it is consumed. It's created and then it disappears. All right. Uh, so that's not true. So that's probably that might be our answer right there. But let's continue. The rate law for this reaction is K NO2 two. So the the rate basically is is dependent on the rate limiting step. So so this equation here. And remember, rate is equal to um, sorry. Okay, is equal to our reactant. Okay, because we're looking at the kinetics, we we can there's two of them, so we can say it's squared, and we have a rate equation, so it's k. So that's true. Yes. All right. Uh, NO3 is an intermediate. Yes, because it gets formed and then it disappears. That's true. And then uh, if you add these two together, they will form this. That's true. Okay. So, so our answer is A. Okay. Uh, so, so we have our question here. Supervisor asks you to determine the enthalpy of a certain chemical reaction. Which would you do? You know, this is a tricky question. You know, it it doesn't. It's. I would ask. I would be ask actually more things. Do I know what the chemical reaction is? Do I need all that stuff? Okay. If it is, it changes my answer, right? So, a. So, measure the delta S and delta G for the reaction, and calculate delta H. Um. You're not going to measure delta S, okay? I mean, it's 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 hard to measure delta S. Now you might look it up on a table, but it you're not going to do that, all right? If you could look up on the table, yeah, you could figure out the delta H, okay? Okay, because delta G using tabled is delta H minus T delta S. Okay, if you're if you know delta S from the table, okay, and you know delta G from the table, and you know the temperature, you can fill delta delta H, but that's presuming a lot. Okay. B, use the bottom camera room dirt to measure the heat of the reaction. So I like this one because it's empirical, um, and if you know the heat of the reaction, you can figure out the enthalpy. All right. For C, use solution calorimeter such a coffee cup to measure the heat. Um, we don't know if the if our substance is, is dissolves in a liquid. Okay, it might be a combustion reaction. So uh, I don't know how you would do that. All right, and plus it's not very uh, not very precise using a coffee cup. And this last one says, yeah, maybe you can do it, but it's just too complicated. The simplest one would be B. You just throw it in a bomb kennel render, heat it up, measure how much temperature is changed, and uh, then you can figure out the heat, the heat of the reaction. Okay, so what we have here is a um, 25 gram sample that's been hit, heated to 100 degrees. And then what we do is we dump it into some water that's at uh, 26 degrees. Okay, and what happens, to kind of make sense, is the temperature of the water 
increases, in fact, decreases, increases to 37, then actually the, the, the substance also um, decreases to 37. So the water temperature goes to 37 and the substance temperature goes to 37 as well. So um, so why, why does that happen? Well, what happens here is, is that this solid uh, is that the two systems want to come to thermal equilibrium and to do that the heat of the substance here is removed and uh, given to the heat of the water. Now the reason why it drops so much is, is that uh, is the different is because of the difference in heat capacity. But the thing is is that they both give off this so when this it's the amount of heat that changes the temperatures. So the amount of heat here uh, may drop it down to 37, okay? But that amount of heat is only going to raise the water up 11 degrees. And that's because it takes a lot more heat to raise the temperature of water than um, the substance. So let's see what we have here. So sample lost more thermal energy than water. Uh, gain because the sample temperature changed more than the water temperature. Okay, so this is saying heat. So the sample lost more heat than the water gained. Okay, no. They both, the same amount of heat moves between the two. And the reason why they have different temperature changes is because of the heat capacity. Even though the sample temperature changed more than the water temperature did, the sample loss, same amount of thermal energy, which is heat, as the water to gain. So that's that's what happens here. So th this guy looks like it lost a lot of temperature, okay, but it lost it lost whatever heat it lost, the lower temperature, but that heat it lost was only able to raise the temperature of the water, okay? So the heat transfer between these two is is the same, it's just that it affects the temperature changed in difference. So, B, uh, C, of the temperature temp changed more than the water temperature did, therefore the heat capacity of the sample must be greater than the heat capacity of water. Okay, heat capacity is how good a sample how bad, I guess you could say, changes temperature. So you can see this sam sample here did a really good job of changing its temperature, so it would have a low heat capacity. <clears throat> so heat capacity is a measure of how good a substance doesn't change its temperature. D. The final temperature is less than the average starting temperature, therefore, the, so it has nothing to do with the average, all right? You could try to figure it out, but it's because the, you got heat capacities are different. If they were both the heat capacities, then you have the same heat capacities, then you could take the average, all right? Okay, so uh, it's kind of like a weighted problem here. So the re So what happens here is the heat of the substance, it's transferred to the water, it increases the temperature of the water by only 11 degrees, and it decreases the temperature of the substance by 74 degrees, and that's because this guy has a lower heat capacity than the water. Okay, so the main thing is here, the heat is the same, transfer, heat of transfer is the same. Okay, so you, this one you have to think about it a little bit, and you have to read it, okay? And so you have some substance that has an internal energy. Now, the way this reads, it says uh, some of that energy, when it comes off, is given off as 65 degrees, I mean 65 joules, and then it looks like 38 of it is given off to do work. Okay, so it looks like the total amount of the change in the energy is going to be the adding of the two, 
and it's going to be a loss, so it's going to be 103 <coughs> joules. Now, okay, I don't want to confuse it, but sometimes we will have these two terms will be combined. Is is that well? Sometimes it said it's that 65 joules come out as heat, and some of that is converted to work. Okay, and so it would look like it might only give off 68 joules. Okay, the other thing is is that uh, you can look at the difference is that it gives off 65 heat and then 38 is useful. Okay, so there's 27 joules. Okay, it's so the way it's worded is some is given off as uh, heat and some is given off of work. Okay. So internal energy is equal to work plus heat, okay? And th these terms could be uh, either work done or the work given off. So just read what it says, okay? It says gives off and does 38. So I'm assuming this is that it gives off 65 and then 38, all right? Um, plus 38. So I would say it's a combination of the two. Okay, so, uh, so you have to look at the stoichiometry of this one. It says 302 gives me 203. So if you think about that, all right, so let's, let's, so if I, so I have two, so the rate says I'm going to make two, times 10 to the 10 minus 7th. Okay, so Okay, so you see that this 3 makes 2. Okay, so what over here makes 2? Well, it should be 3. It should be 3 times 10 to the minus 7. So, right there. Okay. So, 3 times 10 to the minus 7 will have, um, make 2 times 10 to the minus 7. Uh, another way to just think about the ratios here is, is that uh, this ratio here, so, you know, this, there's 3 halves this is three halves bigger than this. So this value here is going to be three halves times this value here, which is this here. Okay, so uh, this one uses uh, the Ernst equation, I believe it's called. So delta G is equal to minus RT ln K. Okay, and you just plug everything in. Uh, so, uh, first of all, just just think about it. It's this K is greater than 1. And if it's greater than 1, that means it's going to favor the product. Therefore, delta G is going to be less than 0. Okay, so, uh, so it's got to be either this value or this value here. All right, so we plug things in. We got delta G is equal to minus R, which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay. Uh, temperature is 298 Kelvin. And then we do the lawn of uh, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 7th. And when you do all that, you end up getting 41,200 and something. Okay. And, um, and so it wants it in kilojoules. And so delta G is going to equal to 41 negative 41.2 kilojoules. Okay. And that Delta, so delta G is negative, uh, K is greater than 1, and those, those two come together. 
Um, hopefully, you you know how to how to plug this in your calculator, etc. Okay. Okay. So this problem says uh, uh, decomposition ethane. Don't have to worry about that. Uh, it says the first order rate equation is 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds to 1 at 700 degrees. What is the half-life of this decomposition? The key word here is first order. And the equation for the half-life is uh, T1 half equals the square root of 2 or 0 0.693 over K, which is this value here. So you just simply go T... One half equals point six nine three divided by five point five times ten to the minus fourth. Okay, seconds one, which just leave you with seconds, and you end up with twenty one hundred. I mean, um, twenty one hundred. Uh, you end up getting, uh, sorry, 1,260 seconds, okay? Okay, here you have second minus one, so it's on the bottom, so it becomes seconds to, uh, one. Uh, we want to have a minute, so we divide by 60, because there's 60 seconds per minute. And when you do that, you end up getting 21 minutes. There's your answer. Okay, the last problem says uh, CHCl3 plus Cl2 gives me CCl4, HCl, and it gives me these three reactions that make my product. Okay, um, first one's fast, second one's slow, and the last one's fast. So it's going to be this reaction that the rate is going to be determined by. Okay, remember rate, okay, is equal to the reactants, okay, K times the reactants, all right, so it's going to be Cl times CH Cl3, okay, so which one of these two has, so this isn't it, um, this looks right, uh, okay, uh, this one's no, because it's it's a CL, and last one is no, because there's no squares. And there's no, if there was a coefficient in here, then you'd have to put that up, and um, as the exponent. But so so that's B. Okay, so so there you go. What I you know, uh, you know there was a set of problems midway that have to do with um. The gas problems, are like I forget problems twenty four or something twenty five, you know, I would I would seriously ask your, uh, you know, get some help from your teacher. Sorry, can't help you out on that one. It's kind of hard to explain with all the, uh, uh, and you need some more thinking about it. So hopefully a lot of this will help you, and um, good luck with your 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 tests.